Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series on ecology. Topic for the day is going to be the intersection between natural selection and animal behavior. So let me get you your one objective for the day. And then we'll go ahead and get going. So by the end of this video, be able to discuss the relationships between natural selection and various animal behavior. So that's what we got. Let's get going. So first thing I want to talk about is why behavior? Why do animals have these behaviors that we've been talking about for the last couple of videos? Um, biggest <clears throat> theory on this about why animals have have certain behaviors is all about survival, whether it is getting food, defending territory, getting a mate, all behaviors somehow seem to enhance the survival and reproductive success of the individual. So that is the why. Let's start talking about how natural selection influences some specific behaviors. Starting with foraging. Foraging is just the search for food, which obviously organisms need food in order to survive. So two examples of natural selection influencing foraging behavior I want to talk about. First one is in the fruit fly, Drosophila. We've been working with flies in the lab forever, sick of them now. But it's interesting, in fruit flies there are two different alleles for a gene that influences foraging behavior. One of them is called the rover allele, the other one is called the sitter allele. In the rover allele, uh, flies that have that allele are more likely to travel further distances to find food. Those with the sitter allele are more likely to stay put to find food. And it's been found that the frequency of each allele in the population is related to the population density. So if you've got a high density population, a lot of flies living together in one place, the rover allele has been shown to show up more frequently because it's beneficial for flies to travel away from the mess of their neighbors to find food. If you are a uh, fly living in a low density situation, the sitter allele is better because you don't want to spend energy flying to get food if you got plenty of food where you live. And scientists have been able to show that if they increase and decrease the density of a fruit fly population, then the frequency of this allele will go up and down appropriately. Another example of this is crows. Um, there are some crows that pull mollusks called whelks out of tide pools. And what they do is they'll pick up this shelled mollusk, fly up, drop it onto rocks, and once it cracks open, they will go ahead and eat the soft inside parts. Now, as the um, crows are going through this behavior, obviously they don't want to fly too high because that will waste energy they don't want to waste, and they don't want to fly too low because then the, um, the whelk won't crack, so they'll have to keep dropping it over and over again. And scientists kind of in a lab experimentally determined that the optimum height should be roughly five meters. Um, that would be the optimum balance between use of energy and the ability to break the whelk open. And they found that in crows, the actual optimum height is like 5.23 meters. So that is one, uh, I guess, piece of evidence that supports the fact that this intersection between cost and benefit determines the actual behavior of the crow. Speaking of risk and reward, um, especially when it comes to feeding, most animals have to make a uh, determination between the risk, usually of being eaten, and the reward of getting food. You have to have food. And this can determine a lot of behaviors. So it's been shown that mule deer living in the mountains, um, they're subject to predation by the puma, cougar, mountain lion, whatever you want to call it. Um, pumas do most of their hunting on the edges of forests. They don't often hunt out in the open grassland areas. They don't often hunt in the dense forest. So natural selection would seem to say that, all right, it is probably best for mule deer to feed out in the open or in the dense forest. And scientists have found that where there is open area available, mule, mule deer are indeed more likely to feed in those open areas. So that's an example of balancing risk and reward and that balancing act determining the behavior of the animal. Now, all these behaviors that we're talking about do note that the animal isn't cognitively thinking, oh, there might be lions nearby, so I'm going to feed out in the open. It's one of those things that's kind of pushed forward by natural selection. Now, one of the things that is, I guess, kind of a laboratory for natural selection affecting behavior is mating and mate systems and, you know, all of that finding a mate stuff. So one thing that is important to talk about is dimorphism. Dimorphism is a difference in appearance between males and females. 
And the mating system seems to kind of determine whether this dimorphism exists or not. Um, there's essentially two major systems. You got polygamy, where one organism will have multiple mates, or you got monogamy, where you know they're pretty much matched up and they stay together. Um, it's been shown that in monogamous systems, the mates seem to be fairly similar in appearance. There isn't a big difference in the appearance between males and females because it's kind of like once you've attracted your mate, your mate's with you, and so staying with that mate is the best way to ensure your reproductive success of having more kids. Now, in situations where there is polygamy, um, multiple mates or uh, promiscuity where mates are hopping from one partner to another, there seems to be pretty great uh, sexual dimorphism between males and females where they look vastly different from each other, especially when the females are doing the picking of the male mates. You can have very drab looking females and then the males have been over time selected for the most outrageous traits, which means that the population has evolved, you know, uh, I guess comparatively, and you end up with a situation where the males and the females look totally different from one another. Also talking, talking about mating and reproduction, um, parental care can influence behavior. Now, the intent of all animals is to ensure that their genes are passed on through their children. So this is going to affect their behavior. Um, in some situations, you have got, let's say, oh, it would be a really good example of this. Well, right there you got fish. Um, in organisms that have some sort of external fertilization, it has been shown that either the male or the female may take care of the young with an equal amount of, I guess, frequency. In situations where there is certainty for the male and female that each of them, that those are their kids, then it's equally likely that the male and female might take care of the young. Now, uh, contrast that with situations where there's internal fertilization. Because internal fertilization like the actual act of fertilization is separated in time from the birth of the young or the laying of the eggs, there isn't absolute certainty that the uh, offspring are the males. So in situations like that, it's much less likely that the male is going to spend energy taking care of the young. The female, of course, are going to take care of the young because she knows that her um, offspring have got her genetic material, so she wants to ensure their survival. The male, because he cannot be absolutely sure that the offspring are his, it's unlikely that he's going to spend the energy taking care of them. Rather, he's going to go off and mate with some other animals to try to pass along his more of his genetic material. So based on how certain an animal can be that the offspring are theirs, that's going to kind of dictate how much time they spend taking care of those young. And there's also um, copying and competition. I talked about dimorphism, so I'm not going to go over that one again. Um, it has been shown that in situations where females select the male mate, you can also get copying. So if there's one individual in a population that seems to show preference for a certain phenotype, the other females in that population are likely to show preference for the same phenotype. Um, researchers have done studies of this using models where they had guppies, and guppies generally select, like female guppies will select the male with the brightest orange uh, pattern. And usually when females are selecting mates, they are selecting for a trait because it ensures the healthiest offspring. So if they can pick the biggest male, he'll probably give the best offspring, or the brightest color will probably give the best offspring, etc. cetera. Um, either way, guppies usually select for the brightest orange coloring. However, scientists showed that if they put a model female fish in the tank, and make that model fish select a male that has less orange coloring, then the other females will do the same. So there's kind of like, I see you doing that, so I'm going to do the same thing. And then, of course, there's competition between males. This is a situation where males choose whether they are going to mate with a female or not. And this is also a situation where there's usually several females around that are available for mating. Males compete. It could be through displays. It could be through actual contact, head headbutting like the mountain goats there. Um, either way, that is a type of intrasexual selection where the males are competing and the winner gets to mate with the females. And this is the last slide for the day. Um, scientists have tried to use game theory to explain the, uh, I guess, behavior of animals. Game theory is theory that explains how people behave in competitive situations. And they've taken the idea of game theory and applied it to some animal behavior. So classic example is this lizard on the side called the side blotched lizard. Um, it comes in three different phenotypes. There's the red-throated version, the blue-throated version, and the yellow-throated version. 
Red throats are hyper aggressive and they protect a large territory with a lot of females in it. Blue throats are medium aggressive. They protect a smaller territory with females in it. And the yellow throats aren't aggressive at all. Rather, they use sneaky tactics to try to sneak in and steal a mate. And <clears throat> what scientists did is they applied the idea of paper, rock, scissors to the mating behavior of these uh, lizards and their distribution around an area. So in paper, rock, scissors, one of each beats the other. So paper beats rock, rock beats scissors, and scissors beats paper. There's only one way for each of them to win. Same situation with the lizards. And they found that, indeed, the same cycle kind of happens, where for a while, the red lizards will dominate the area. And then after a while, the blue lizards, or actually I think those red lizards, are taking care of a big area. Since it's a big area, they can't necessarily take care of all the females, so the yellow lizards sneak in, and they start to mate with the females. As they become more prevalent, their lack of defense mechanisms allow the blue lizard to come back in, and he can start defending a small territory. And then eventually, the red lizard and its aggressiveness comes back in and takes things over again. So it's a cycle, just like paper, rock, scissors. That would be an example of game theory applied to animal behavior. And like I've said, with all these behaviors that we've talked about today, the main idea we were going for is the fact that natural selection and the desire to live and pass on your genes dictates the behavior of organisms. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. We'll see you again.